We're going to be in a couple different scriptures tonight. We're going to be in Luke chapter 4 and in Matthew chapter 4 as well. So Luke chapter 4 and Matthew chapter 4. Hopefully um, you're continuing to enjoy your time in your groups as we continue to discuss how we might become different people, how we might be changed. And actually, I want to stop right there for just a minute. How many of you like change? By a show of hands, how many of you enjoy change? Does anyone enjoy change? Okay, so about 12 of you out of the group. So uh, change is not something we necessarily are excited about when it comes to us being the ones that are the, the ones that are called to change, right? When, when other people need to change, I have very strong opinions about it, right? Other people need to do the changing. Other people need to rework how they drive and the way that I want to live my life. But when it comes to change or habits or patterns that I have in my life, I, uh, I kind of throw up my defense and I don't really want to do it. Anyone in that boat with me a little bit? So some of you are being honest. Wonderful. I love that. So uh, change is actually something that God really, really cares about. Change is something that, that God actually in multiple locations in his scripture focuses on. And change is one of the ways that God meets us where we're at, but calls us to be people that he desires us to be. Let me read a couple verses to you really quick that remind us that God desires change for our life. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. The old has passed away and the new has come. You believe in Jesus, you are becoming a different person. In Ezekiel 36, 26, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a, and, and give you a heart of flesh. So God is desiring to give us something new. It goes on Romans 12 two. do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that the, by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is the good and acceptable and perfect will be transformed, be changed, renew your mind that you might become a different person. Philippians 1, 6. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at that day of Christ Jesus. Psalm 139, verse 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And if you see any grievous way in me, lead me in the way everlasting. God is interested in change. God desires change. And although we as people don't necessarily love it because it requires us to change our habits and our patterns and the way that we like doing things, our preferences and our desires, God desires that we change and become the people that he desires for us. One of the verses we're going to read tonight later in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17 Jesus says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That word repent is closely associated with the idea of change. We're going to get to that later. But, but Jesus will say the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is at hand. And before we jump in, I want to start there because it's important that we recognize that as Jesus begins his ministry, as Jesus starts ministering to the people that are around him, he has a very clear task that we would change, that the world that he is in at that time would change. And that's why he uses the phrase, the kingdom of God is at hand. Now we all know what a kingdom is, right? A kingdom has a what? has a king and then a bunch of citizens that are in the kingdom with them. And the king is in charge. His rule, his reign, his authority, his desires, his wishes, his wills are accomplished as the king. Remember what Jesus prays. Our father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your what? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Heaven. Jesus comes and one of the first things he says is repent for the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus is trying to prepare us as he begins his ministry. That's where we'll be tonight. He's preparing us and saying we got to be people that are ready to change. 
We gotta be people that are prepared to change the way that God has desired of us. So let's jump into the scriptures tonight. We're gonna start in Luke chapter four, verse 31 and 32. And this is the beginning of Jesus's ministry, but we're gonna see that these steps and these changes that are there at the beginning of Jesus's ministry are gonna lay a foundation for Jesus to continue to execute change amongst the world and amongst the people. And it's gonna be a challenge for us as we consider how we might change as well. Luke chapter four, verse 31 and 32, it says this, and he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath. And they were astonished at his teaching for his word possessed authority. Check this out. So, so Jesus uh, goes to Capernaum in Galilee, but really to understand these two little verses as the beginning of Jesus' ministry, we have to go back a little bit. So jump back up with me to verse 16, chapter four, verse 16. You'll notice that right before this, Jesus is tempted in the desert. Satan tries to try him in three different ways and each time Jesus replies with his word, it is written and replies to Satan in saying, I will not fall victim to your temptation because of God's word. It says this, and he came to Nazareth, verse 16, and where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, he went to the synagogue, and on the Sabbath day, he stood up and read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind and set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. I almost said flavor. It's not flavor. So you know what happened? Someone texted me about Baskin Robbins like two minutes ago and I'm thinking about ice cream right now. Favor, favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. We're not going to get into what is laid out in this text specifically, where Jesus speaks and quotes from the prophet Isaiah. Chet's actually going to touch on that next week. But I want you to see, Jesus goes to Nazareth. Nazareth is, is his hometown. He goes to where he was born and raised. And it's here that he speaks, reads from the prophet and says, today scripture is fulfilled. He goes in and he speaks a, a, a longer section in verses 23 through 27. He says a variety of things, like I said, you're gonna get into next week, but look at verses 28. Look at verse 28. When they all heard these things, and in the synagogue, they were filled with wrath. And they rose up, drove him out of the town, brought him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built so that they could throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. Jesus speaks to his hometown. He reads from the prophet Isaiah and says, today the scripture has been fulfilled. And how do the people respond. They look at Jesus and in the section later, he speaks about that a prophet is not welcome in his hometown and they do exactly actually what he says because they ask this question, who is this, the, the son of Joseph? They, they don't understand who Jesus is. They don't, they don't think he can fulfill the scriptures. He's simply just a man. He's, he's the son of Joseph. We know him. We've seen him. We've seen him grow up. We know who this guy is. And it's here that we read that, that then the next thing that Jesus does is he leaves. He goes to the next town, the next city. He, he starts something new. And change requires that we do something new, that we start something new. Jesus goes and he says, he went to Capernaum, the city of Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath and they were astonished at his teaching for his word possessed authority. Check it out. Jesus doesn't stay in his hometown where it's safe and convenient and he knows all the people, where it's relative to him, right? All of us have, all of us have experienced this before. We know every back road and shortcut and everything to get home quickly, right? But then we travel somewhere else and we're like, if I didn't have my phone, I, where's my Thomas guide? Does anyone know? You guys know what a Thomas guide is, yeah, right? Right, flip through the pages. 
I insulted all of you because you should be asking me that. That's what just happened, right? <laughs> hey, uh, millennial, do you know what a Thomas guide is, right? Like that's what you all just experienced in your mind. I apologize for that comment. Delete it from your mind, okay? Right? But we've been there before. There's something about our hometown that we love. We know the best places. We know where our friends live. We know the shortcuts around town. It's convenient and it's safe. Jesus doesn't just stop at convenience and comfortableness and safety. He's willing to do something new. He's willing to put off the old and put on the new. Remember what it says in the book of Ephesians. We read it earlier. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. If we're gonna respond to Jesus, if we're gonna walk as Jesus did, Jesus was willing to do something new. Jesus was willing to forego the convenience and the comfortableness of his home down for the conviction of what God had called him to. And he's really demonstrating for the disciples what he will teach them in the future, right? He says, go and preach the gospel. If you're received, then bring your favor to this town. If they, if they don't want you, then shake off the dust off your feet and go to the next town. Jesus is preaching what he will call the people to practice. He's practicing what he's preaching. He's willing to do something new. Change requires doing something new. It's, I heard it said before that insanity is trying to do the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. And this is the hardest thing for us because we are people that like the way things are. Right? Right? Just the other day, I, my phone updated. This is such a lame example, but it's so true. My phone updated and like things changed on my phone. Has it happened to you? We updated your phone in the nighttime while you were sleeping, right? I'm like, oh my gosh. I'm like, where, how do I even, where are my contacts? How do I make a call, right? We like things the way they are. But if we're going to follow Jesus' example, he's willing to leave comfort and convenience for the conviction of doing something new. It goes on and it says in verse 32, they were astonished at his teaching for the word possessed authority. Notice the different reaction of the people. The people in Nazareth in his hometown wanted to kill him and throw him off the cliff. The people in Capernaum, they were astonished. Right? They were blown away by what he had to say because his word had authority. Jesus was a great rabbi, a great teacher. He didn't have to quote other rabbis. He quoted the scriptures, just like he did when he was tempted in the wilderness with Satan. Right? He was practicing what he's preaching. He's going to demonstrate even greater authority in, in the section after Luke where he will heal multiple people to say, I have authority even over illness. The words I say are true. I am Jesus. I can do the things because I'm going to show you through what I can do with my miracles and the signs that are there. Turn with me to Matthew chapter four. We're going to get a different lens and a different uh, part of the story in which Matthew shares with us. Jesus also leaving and going to Capernaum. Matthew chapter four, we're going to start in verses 13 through 17. And it says this, now when he heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee and leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea and in the ter territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that that was spoken of the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun and the land of Zephali and the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region and the shadow of death on them, a light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Notice what happens in verses 12 and 13. Now, when he heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee, leaving Nazareth. He went and lived in Capernaum by the sea in the ter territory of Zebulon and Naphtali 
Jesus is purposeful when he leaves. Not only is he rejected and that motivates part of his leaving, but in a second way, he hears that John the Baptist has been arrested. And Jesus is purposeful with with why he waits till John the Baptist being arrested. Remember what it says in the book of John, right? He says that there was one that came as the light, but there's also one that came as a witness to the light. John came before to prepare the way of Jesus. We, we, we learned about this. You guys studied this a couple weeks ago as you, as you learned about John the Baptist, right? He's out in the wilderness. He's got weird clothes on. He's eating locusts and honey. He's saying, make straight the way of the Lord, right? He's, he's not got a, a lot of fans, right? That's probably why he's in, in jail. That's why he's been arrested. He says, though, that he says himself in John chapter 3, verse 30, he says, I must decrease that he may increase. John had a clear picture and his understanding that he was the forerunner to Jesus. He was to prepare the way. And as much as John himself said, I must decrease and Christ must increase, Jesus was also patient. Jesus also waited. Jesus also took the challenge and the opposition of what was before him And allowed it to be a cue for him to say, as now he's decreasing, now is my time to come and start my ministry. Jesus didn't want to confuse people. He didn't want John the Baptist and Jesus out there. He wanted one clear leader to be there. So he waits until John now is arrested and uses it as a cue for him to continue to move forward and start his ministry. And the the lesson we learn is that change is often brought about by opposition and discouragement. It's brought about by opposition and discouragement. Jesus sees that John has been arrested, but actually takes that as an opportunity and as a sign from the Lord, as a cue from his heavenly father to say, okay, now is my time. Now is my time for me to go. And we're reminded of the words from the book of Romans. Chapter five, verses three through five. It says, not only that, but we rejoice in our suffering, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character. Character produces hope. Hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit has been given to us. In your groups, if you go to group, you're going to look at James chapter one, verses two through four, in which it says, consider it pure joy when you face trials of all kinds. The end of verse four says that you may be mature and complete. Jesus looked at the opposition that was before him and took it as an opportunity to bring about change, an opportunity to cue him in to say, God is moving. God wants to change us and, and, and move us forward to a new thing. So I will begin my ministry. Now, the question for us is, is do we do that in our life? Do we look at opposition and discouragement and trials that come our way as an opportunity for us to grow? As a way for God to share and show and communicate to us what the next step in our life is? Or is it just discouragement and trials and temptation? I'm reminded of uh, the book of Acts in Acts chapter eight, verse one. And if you remember, Jesus says in the beginning of Acts, he says, um, he says the, the disciples are wondering, right? He tells them to wait in the book of Luke. He says, go to Jerusalem and wait. Wait for me, I have a gift for you, right? And, and the disciples are there, they're, they're with Jesus. He's risen from the grave. They said, now, when are you gonna restore your kingdom, right? He says, enough for you to know And then he tells them their mission. He tells them what they're to do. He says, and you and the, you will be my witnesses. The Holy Spirit will come upon you with power and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now, just seven chapters later, we find out something that happens in the book of Acts. Remember, Stephen is killed for his faith. He's martyred for his faith. And martyr means witness, right? He was witnessing about Jesus. And Paul is there and he says, let's, well, he's Saul at that point. Saul says, yes, he approves the killing of Stephen. What happens in Acts chapter one, Acts chapter eight, I'm sorry, 
verse one. It says this, and I want to read it because I want you to hear, hear what happens. It says this, and Saul approved of his execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And what happens? And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea, Samaria, except the apostles. So God uses persecution of the church to accomplish his will, to bring about change. Jesus promised it in Acts chapter 1. Seven chapters later, after Stephen is killed, Saul is there approving the execution. God actually uses that to then now go to a different area, to a different city, to a different region, to accomplish the very task that he desired for us. Change is brought about by opposition. I'm always reminded of the illustration of, of um, what is it? Um, what is a pearl made in? An oyster, right? So that, that, that oyster, I can't think of that. I'm thinking muscle for some reason in my mind, right? I got shellfish on the brain, right? Um, that oyster, it starts as an irritation of a piece of sand. And through that process becomes something beautiful and amazing. Now it's like, we're all, we got pearls and all that sort of stuff, right? It started as irritation as a tiny piece of sand and now it's something beautiful. Jesus recognizes that, that John going to prison, although hard, although difficult, is just an opportunity for him to say a change is needed. It goes on, verses 13 through 4, 16 in the book of Matthew chapter 4. Turn back there with me, if you will. Leaving Nazareth, he lived in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali. So that there was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light and those dwelling in the region and the shadow of death. On them, a light has dawned. Jesus goes to per Capernaum with purpose. It's this little fishing town right by the Sea of Galilee. It's on the trade route, right? No rabbi would really go there because it's filled with a variety of people. It's a, it's a more diverse city because it's, it's on the trade route. So there's a lot of different people there. There's not, not a lot of Jews that are living in the town, but, but Jesus is directed by the word. He's directed by the word that guides him there. The prophecy from Isaiah, and it's one that you know well, if you continue through the rest of the, rest of the verses, it's all the verses that we're gonna read in a couple months when it gets closer to Christmas, right? To us, a child is born. To us, a son is given, right? On his shoulders. That's the Isaiah passage. It's, it's connected to Jesus as the Messiah. Jesus knows these as a, as a young Jew, as a boy, he would be studying these scriptures and he's allowing that to direct his life. Change requires obedience to the word of the Lord. Change requires that we, we live in faith and respond in obedience to God's word. He allowed that to direct him, right? No other rabbi would choose to go there. It wasn't this great place. It's filled with a lot of different people from a, a lot of different regions, a lot of different people groups. And he purposed to go there that he might be exactly what God had spoken of him, that he might be the great light. And if you remember last Christmas, our Christmas theme was a light has dawned. This was the scripture we talked about. So change requires obedience through faith and commitment to the word. Jesus allowed his life to be directed by that. Jesus knew those scriptures and was purposed to when, when opposition came his way to look to the Lord and wait upon him to guide him. And, and the question for us, the challenge for us is what are the scriptures? What are the verses? What, are the, what is the truth of Jesus that is guiding our life? That is bringing about the change that God desires in us. Remember what Jesus says in John chapter 15. He's with the disciples. He's in the upper room. And he says, I am the vine. You are the branches. 
right? Abide in me and I will abide in you. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will bear much fruit. Remember what he says at the end of the Matthew uh, chapter seven, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, he gives a, a picture of a wise and foolish builder. If you want to be like the wise builder, you listen to the words and you do them. You build your house on the rock. You want to be a foolish builder? You listen to the words, but you don't do them. You build your house on the sand. God is wanting to change and shape and form us and transform us into the people that we want to be. We just read five verses about it. We've got to let that change take place through obedience to his word, not just the things around us, right? I'm well aware of this now. My, my son is in kindergarten. He's going to school. He's learning all sorts of stuff at, at school, right? Bringing stuff home. He's teaching me stuff like about Fortnite and different things, right? And it's a little scary, right? But the, the truth stands that Words affect our lives. The world around us can transform us. If we're directed by the things around us rather than the word of the Lord, we're not going to change into the people that God desires us to be. May we learn the word and be transformed by it in a way like Jesus did. He was directed by the word. He knew that prophecy. He knew the promise that he was supposed to fulfill as the Messiah. And he allowed that to direct his next step, even though that, that wasn't the place that everyone thought he was going to go. And then he says this in verse 17. From the time Jesus began to preach, saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus uses the word repent very specifically and very purposefully and the, the lesson for us is that change requires repentance. Change requires repentance. And here's, here's what repentance is. It, it, it's not simply saying sorry. It's not simply apologizing. It's not simply confession, although part of it. Those things are all part of it. But the idea, the 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 connotation, the picture of repentance is that you would turn away from sin. Turn away from the thing that is leading you away from God and turn yourself back to God. It's actually uh, used in that time as a military term, right? The soldiers would march and to repent, for them to repent would be to do what? Come about, turn the other way and walk back the other way. And Jesus is desiring change in all of us. He's saying, guys, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It started. I'm the son of God. I'm here. And God wants you to change. Repent. Don't just say sorry, but repent. Remember what, what Peter says in the book of Acts after he gives this amazing speech after Pentecost. He says, repent and believe and be baptized. Turn from your old ways. Be changed by God, turn from your sin, and turn to God. Be changed. Change requires doing something new. Change requires seeing opposition as opportunity. Change requires obedience in faith to the word of the Lord, and change requires repentance. Now, here's the thing. It would be very easy for us to look at this scripture, look at the beginning of Jesus' ministry and hear all this talk of change and transformation and just think to ourselves, why doesn't God just like me the way I am? <laughs> right? But we know that we don't know ourselves the best. Right? We know that there's things about us that, that need to and should change. And God, as the perfect parent, as the one that loves us and made us and created us and breathed his breath into us, sees us exactly where we are and he meets us where we're at. Don't miss that. He meets us right where we're at, but he loves us too much to leave us there. He wants us to take us to where he wants us to go. 
That's God's love. He meets us where we're at, but it's not enough for just meet us there. He's got to take us to where he wants us to go. That we might be the people, that we might live as people that are part of the kingdom here on earth and one day for eternity. Amen?